And when people start to learn the importance of market correlations, how um, you can use bonds to trade Forex, how can you can use um, stocks um, to trade Forex, how you can use um, your dollar to um, trade gold, they start to see the market in a different way. So welcome back everyone to listening down with Cathy Lean. Looking forward to talk about trading again. We spoke a few years back, so it's good to have you here again, Cathy. Look forward to discuss trading, your experience, how you change over time, how you evolve. So welcome back on the podcast. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's it's indeed been a long time. I think it's been at least five or six years since we last spoke, if not longer. So um, I definitely appreciate coming on and talking about my trading and how things and, and the industry has changed in general. Yeah, so definitely tell me a bit more about kind of what's changed since we last spoke. I know it's been a bit of time. So a lot has changed, but um, at the same time, very little has changed. Um, now, in terms of you know what uh, has changed, you know I think that you know in the past five or six years, um, there's been a lot of major significant events in the market. And I think, you know, what has changed um, is that, you know, a lot of people are getting much more interested in macro and fundamental um, stories and learning about how fundamentals um, can affect their trade. I'm really excited about that at TM because, you know, what hasn't changed is that fundamentals has been a part of my trading for the, the past two decades. I started trading in 1999 and from the very beginning, um, fundamentals has been, you know, a key component of my trade, but on a much more short-term basis. You know, fundamentals I used, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, news trading as well as looking at what um, the market is pricing in for central banks and using that for uh, more short-term trades. But between COVID, the banking crisis, and the wars, and a lot of you know other things that are happening that happened in the past couple of years, and then also what's anticipated in 2024, I think that you know being able to um, understand and dive deeper into fundamentals um, is something that I spend much more time doing these days because I'm getting so much interest in understanding, you know, the elections, understanding, you know, geopolitical risks. I mean, for example, in 2024, I don't know if you know, but it's the first time ever that more than half of the world's population has an election in their country. So this is very significant. And, you know, I live in the U.S. You know, there's a very big election happening in the U.S. in um, 2024. Uh, we could we're, we say it could be the battle of the octogenarians between Trump and Biden. And then we have these ongoing wars. So being sensitive to, um, you know, what is happening in the um, global environment being able to learn how to look at market sentiment and then being able to apply that to trading, um, I think has been um, you know, something that a lot of traders are interested in. In the past five years, in, my, in terms of my own trading, while my technical trading strategy um, has not changed at all, I've been trading my um, zip trading setup you know, for the past um, eight or nine years now. What has changed is I've really fine tuned it. And I think that's really important for many traders, which is that, you know, throughout the course of time and throughout the course of um, your um, live trading um, and your trading strategies, it's important to understand when your trading strategy works and when it doesn't. And I feel like um, in the past few years, I've become much more selective about my trading. I've become much more um, uh, diligent in only trading, for example, the New York Open and the Asia Open, only trading when um, the fundamental, technical, and sentiment conditions are right for my trade. And then only you know trading when the markets, um, I wouldn't say are um, calmer, but when we don't have heavy event risk ahead of us. You know, I've um, really come up with a rule set where you know I will, as much as tempting as it may be, I will never trade ahead of the U.S. inflation report or ahead of the U.S. Um, central bank meeting or ahead of the European central bank meeting because in the past five years, it's become even more clear to me that, you know, it is just as important to know when not to trade as when to trade. And, you know, I've been spending a lot of time looking at my own trading and my res own results to really pull out the weak scenarios 
to focus on the, um, and I've always been about this, to focus on the highest accuracy trades. And to do that, it also involves knowing when not to trade. And you know, it could be the time of day, it could be the day of the month, depending upon economic data. So a lot has changed in terms of um, the increased incorpor incorporation of fundamentals, as well as being much more selective. But a lot has not changed because I'm still trading the same strategy. You know, Boris, my colleague, my trading partner, Boris and I are very different. Boris is evolving his trading strategy pretty much by, you know, the minute. And whereas I have the same strategy I've been trading for, you know, what will be more than a decade. Um, and, you know, it's, and that is a testament to um, the strategy. It's a testament to my confidence um, in what I do. What do you think makes a strategy that doesn't have to be changed over time? Like you don't have to change the rules, the, 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 the framework behind it. What makes it so good? Well, what makes it so good is really, you know, number one, understanding the dynamics of the market. You know, it's a really good question. It's very tempting, especially with new traders that come in, to, um, to automatically look for the tops and bottoms. You know, many new traders are, in, are you know, we're humans, right? So we always want to go against the trend. And we also want to go against the, um, the, what's popular and say it cannot possibly keep on rising. It cannot possibly keep on falling. And what makes my trading strategy so great is something very simple, which is recognizing that um, the very simple line that the trend is your friend on both a long-term basis as well as a short-term basis. And what makes my trading strategy so effective is that it is that I only trade in the direction of the trend um, when market sentiment is on my side. So if you drill that down a little further, what does that really mean? What does market sentiment really mean? Market sentiment means um, the how investors and traders feel. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the long-term trends, for example, to be um, bullish dollar yen. But I also want market sentiment. I also want investors on a short-term basis to be bullish dollar yen as well. So I'm looking for, at the end of the day, the long-term and the short-term trend to be on my side. And I'm looking for the fundamentals also to be on my side. So what makes uh, my trading strategy so great and what makes a trading strategy so great is that number one, I'm trading with the trend. It's not that hard. You know, yes, you can make um, money picking tops and bottoms and fading you know, resistance levels and swing highs and swing lows, but you're going to make a lot more money with less stress on a more consistent basis by going with the trend. And you know, I assure you that I've done this for two decades. It really works. It's much um, easier to trade with the trend than against it. And then what works is that you want you know, the rest of the market to you know, be, be in your direction as well. And that is where we wanna look at fundamentals. We wanna look at how stocks are doing. We wanna look how bonds are doing. We wanna look at how gold is doing. So having all of this in sync with your trade um, and making sure that you look for those things and only trade when those things are in line with the trade is what makes um, a trading strategy so great. But it's not just that, Etienne. You know, a lot of it is the entry. A lot of it is the exit strategy as well. I am, you know, a, I'm aware that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, if I'm trading, if I'm holding, usually my positions that I hold, last, um, no more, I have day trades and my swing trades. I'm much more active in my day trades. My day trades usually last anywhere from, um, you know, 20 minutes to um, 15 hours. And um, what's really important about that is that um, I recognize with those trades that usually um, the sweet spot for um, these day trades is anywhere between 20 to 60 pips and I try when it gets to 20 pips in my profit I start to try to take some money off the table move my stops up for my day trade especially when I'm trading right at the New York open for my Asia trades I usually will be a little bit more fluid and allow them to carry overnight and maybe go for 60 pips but if you think about it unless it's a really really big um, overnight story or overnight movement 
a 60 pip movement overnight is probably the max that you would expect. So I've also been much more um, uh, refined in my exit. And most importantly, when a trade is not moving my way, I'll get out. And I am ruthless when it comes to um, to getting out of trades that are just simply not moving my way. Because based upon my technique, uh, the trades should be moving in my direction quickly. It may not get full profit quickly, but it should not be moving in the opposite direction quickly. And so if it is, I will cut the trade. So being able to um, have a selectivity in your entry and then also being ruthless in your exits, um, I think is, uh, and focusing just as much on both because you can't make money if you're not taking profits, um, is really what makes the trading strategy great where I'm not just focusing on the entry. I'm also making sure I bank my pips and I bank my pips consistently. You're one of the very few traders that talks about trading the Asian session. Most people assume the Asian session is too slow, it's boring, there's no trades there. How do you trade it? What's different from Asian sessions that's in New York or other sessions in the market? Asia is actually my most lucrative session to trade. It's my favorite. I make the most money. I have the less stre least stress. And usually um, when I try to watch the markets too closely, that's when I end up making money. If I put on my trade, I step away and I have dinner with my family and you know that's when the trades really are the best. And the reason why um, I trade the Asia session well is first of all, um, I think it's important to define the Asia session, right? The Asia session that most people avoid, in my opinion, is basically between the New York close and the um, Tokyo open. So, or, or maybe even the, um, I guess after the Australian open, so really the Tokyo open. So I do not trade between um, 5 p.m. New York time and um, 8 p.m. New York time. That is the dead of Asia. You know, it's not even Asia because everyone's asleep still for the most part. So that's more like the dead of trading. So between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., definitely, you know, listen to everyone else that's telling you not to trade. I put my trades on right at 8 p.m. New York time, always. And that's, you know, basically when Australia and New Zealand has already opened and data from those countries are, you know, for the most part, um, out. Sometimes Australia will release later data, but a lot of times they'll release data before that. And Tokyo, um, Singapore, Hong Kong are just opening. So my strategy works the best at market opens. And the reason is because oftentimes, you know, we may have some major U.S. event risk or the market may be um, moving in one direction during the New York session. And so the Asia, that time of the night at 8 p.m., the, what I define as the Asia Open is when those traders are waking up, they're dissecting the movements that are happening in the, um, that happens in the New York session, and then they're laying on the trades. So that is a very important time for me to trade because that's when we get the Asia Open momentum and flow. And very often, um, you will get a very quick, abrupt move at the Asia Open, particularly in the euro crosses and the yen crosses. So I love to trade euro Aussie, euro Kiwi, euro CAD. I love to trade Aussie yen, Kiwi yen, CAD yen um, during that time. And um, so initially, we'll have a burst of action, which, you know, if I'm lucky, which I would say maybe is about 50, 60% of the time, I'll hit my profit targets in the first hour between 8 to 9, 9.30 p.m. New York time. If I don't, in the, the other, I would say, you know, 45 to 50%, it'll be quiet. I'll hold my positions. Maybe there'll be a little bit of movement around 10.30 p.m., 11 p.m., but I'll hold it overnight, and then it'll move my, in my direction at the European Open when I'm sleeping, at the London Open around 2 a.m. So really, it's based upon um, the idea that, you know, Asian traders and London traders or European traders, they're waking up. They're looking at, first of all, what happened in um, the New York session. They're looking at, you know, the data that's been released in Australia and New Zealand, if it's in the London session, and they're riding those moves. And, you know, that's what I do. 
um, I trade the most active hours um, in the um, Asia session, which is only after um, Tokyo, Singapore and Hong Kong open. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people should look into it because it's a session where, again, it's not talked about too much. There's a lot of ways you can trade that session also. And it's uh, definitely more interesting to hear about. Yeah. I also want to add, you know, for my swing trades, it's a great time to lay on swing trades too. Because, you know, nothing really happens between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. New York time. And sometimes if something does happen, it's oftentimes a fake out. So if you're in Asia and you're waking up um, around, you know, 7 or 8 a.m. your time, usually that candle close on the daily candle of the day prior is still a valid one. And you're getting a little bit of affirmation when you're seeing the initial market movement. So laying on swing trades based upon... Um, the New York session close and the Asia open um, is also a very effective strategy when you're trading the Asia session. Have the instruments you trade changed over the years? Do you still trade the same pairs or have you added other things, either crypto or I guess indices or something over the years? So um, the only thing I've added is gold. I've become um, more I become more aggressive in trading euro crosses, as we just talked about. Um, I, you know, my str I, when I see a setup in euro Aussie, euro Kiwi, euro CAD, Kiwi Swiss, Aussie Swiss, any you know commodity pair based currency, um, I will usually tr um, lean more into them. I will be much more apt to take those trades because they work the best for my trading strategy. I will um, avoid trading. Uh, for example, sterling, I, because, you know, sterling, I've learned to become is just too volatile um, for my strategy. And that includes all of the tr sterling crosses. But um, I've also gotten to trading gold and um, gold works very well with my zip trading strategy. Um, zip also works really well in the indices as well as Bitcoin. But I think for me, it's just a matter of focus. Um, it's, yeah, I, it's very hard for me to, um, focus on, uh, all of the Forex instruments as well as gold, as well as Bitcoin, as well as the indices. But, um, my trading partner, Boris through the years has changed a lot and he's actually doesn't trade Forex anymore. And he specializes in trading Bitcoin, the NASDAQ, the, um, ES, um, DAX, uh, as well as gold. So, you know, we definitely have become, our strategies have become much more um, refined in those instruments as well. But I think he finds and I find that it's very difficult to split your in, your focus. And Forex has long been lucrative for me and long been the market of um, my, my choice and the, you know, what's generated the most pips for me. And so, you know, why change what's not broken, right? And um, that's why, you know, I focus exclusively on Forex. But, you know, I do trade gold as well. One of the things that's been on the news quite a bit the past, I would say the past year or so, is prof firms. I know you talk about prof firms in some of your videos on YouTube. First of all, what's your thought on prof firm these days, where you think it's going, and kind of what's the future of prof firms? Well, in 2023, there was um, a little bit of scandal in the prof firm industry with my Forex funds being um, shut down by U.S. and Canadian regulators. And there was a lot of fear in the industry that this would be in the end of prop firms in general. Prop firms really thrived in the past year. And a lot of people um, really kind of latched on to the value propositions of prop firms because yes, um, what came to light is that a lot of these prop firms are not allowing the trader to trade real money at the onset. A lot of these prop firms are, have them on demo accounts and on um, virtual money. And that became um, something that, you know, perhaps many prop traders did not realize. Um, and there was a lot of fear that this would mean the end of the industry. But I think, you know, as time progressed, um, the, you know, not only did we see that the prop term firm industry for the time being has survived these scandals, that um, it's also made everyone more honest. It made everyone realize that these prop accounts in some ways are um, more interesting demo accounts. Because in demo accounts, you cannot, you don't get to keep your profits, right? Um, you're just paper trading, whatever you're making is a experimentation for your live account. 
But um, what the prop firm industry allowed is that you're still kind of play, playing and trading this virtual money, but you're putting some capital up to do so. And it's not capital, but you're paying a evaluation fee to do so. Anywhere from 100 to a few hundred to, you know, low thousands of dollars to paper trade as much as a million dollars, anywhere from 25,000 to a million dollars. And you actually um, get to keep your, your um, part of your profits, if you, of, the, of your paper profits, if you make them. So it, um, it's changed the opportunity for a lot of traders because you know they may not necessarily have the have you know $25,000 and certainly not 100 200 a million dollars in capital to trade with so they could trade with uh, that amount of capital using only um, a couple hundred dollars if they pass their um, evaluations and so um, I think that this gives opportunity to a lot of traders who um, don't have the capital to access the markets. It also is um, what I like to call the ultimate stop, right? Because when you have an account, um, $10,000, you you know may not really be willing to risk that entire $10,000 because it may be a significant amount to you. Whereas these days, you can control $10,000 to $25,000 for only a couple hundred dollars. And that is in many ways your ultimate backstop and your ultimate stop. So, you know, what we're seeing is that people, instead of spending, you know, $10,000 or even $2,500 of that $10,000 um, in the market, they're spending $2,500 of that money in evaluation accounts, in prop accounts, so that they can um, test their strategies, so that they can um, uh, refine a strategy that they can actually use um, when they um, actually trade in real time and want to start making serious money. So um, I think there's a lot of very interesting um, opportunities that the prop industry provides traders, but I think the My Forex Fund scandal um, was a wake-up call made, making them realize that it's not as um, clean of an opportunity as some of these prop firms has promised. And it also made these prop firms more honest and more, um, you know, bas basically, you know, look behind their backs on what they're offering to um, traders because they have regulators that are starting to scrutinize them. So I think the prop firm is here to stay, and I think prop industry is here to stay. It's going to get, you know, only, you know, more um, fair to the um, average trader. And I think it's a great way for traders to A, learn how to trade, B, you know, um, learn how to not only, you know, learn a good trading strategy, but learn how your own emotions and psychology work with money management when you're trading and basically how you behave as a trader. And then, you know, uh, C, be able to trade greater capital than you necessarily have access to. And it will, you know, there is a statistic that most prop traders, when they start trading, fail which is why these prop firms um, are, are so profitable. But it's also a, in many ways, cheap way to learn how to be a good trader. And I think you know that we can look at the bright sides to a lot of this as well. And I think it's not going away. I think it's a new um, way to trade. And what's really interesting in Tian is that there are different types of prop firms that are emerging these days. You do have the classic prop firms that are offering you an evaluate, you have to pay an evaluation account in order to um, be given the opportunity to pass a test and then to control real money. But then you also have um, brokers that are starting to get into this space where um, you may not necessarily have to pay an evaluation account in order to, um, to, to attempt the test and pass the test. And then you also have prop firms that are giving you the opportunity if you pass the test and you know reach a certain level to trade other people's money. So I think the industry is evolving in very interesting ways and um, I'm very excited to watch its progression. I think you make a good point. I think a lot of traders will take these accounts way before they're ready for them. And that could be why a lot of people are losing also their account. 
but that's a problem that I see a lot of people who spend like many times on the same account. They want to get it back. They want to get it back. They lose it again. They want to get back to it. So that can be an issue. I know they don't lose money in the market necessarily, which is a good thing. But if they lose money in the platform, it's not even better in that case. So I think people have to be ready also for the platform account. Uh, and like you said, there's a lot of these platforms now with like no monthly payment or, or no cost to get started, which is kind of cool with the brokers. Uh, that that I'm very curious to see how it's going to evolve because that's a really good way to, to do it. Uh, but still, people have to be ready for these accounts, I think. Absolutely. I mean, it's just a different approach because you could also be spending that money um, in the market too. And it depends upon what are you doing. Are you just trying to hit it big every single time? Or are you actually trying to refine your strategy and learn from it every single time? Are you buying five prop accounts to try five different strategies and learn to see which one works? Or are you just trying to maximize lever on each one to try to um, pass your evaluation? So intention is obviously very important too. Do you recommend traders to go demo when they try to learn strategies? Or do you, do you recommend them to go on a small live account to at least kind of get some, some feet in the game? Well, you know, it's always um, a good idea to try demo first. But there's nothing like real trading. Because when you're demo trading, it's very different from the psychological aspect of real money. Even if it's not, um, even if it's a small amount of money that you've put, put, put in, like a prop account, adding the psychological element uh, makes a huge difference in your uh, behavior in trading. So I think that there is no replacement for, um, for real trading. And that demo trading is a good start, but it is only going to get you so far because it's not real money. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a personality thing. Some people are okay with demo. They, they love it. They can stick to it. Some people just, they cannot make it work. They have to go to a small live account. So it's very different. Yes. Tell me a bit more about fundamentals. I know this is a topic that you are very familiar with. Do you feel like people are getting more into fundamentals or they're kind of moving more away from fundamentals? Are they going more to like technical, the kind of uh, the platform you can just buy and like, like sell and like see the charts like Robinhood and stuff? Or are they actually kind of interested more in the technical these days, uh, the fundamental these days? I think that um, technicals will always, and chart reading will always be the way most traders start because it's the simplest, right? I mean, you learn a um, strategy, you learn a pattern, and you look at it in the charts and you hopefully, you know, um, learn how to make money from there and just repeat it over and over again. But I think that what people will discover is that you know while um, the technicals are you know uh, interesting, that you know that a lot of times they are not that you know the technicals are basically trading the past right, and fundamentals um, are about trading you know what could happen in the future and what's understanding the big story and understanding the general direction uh, of where of um, where these instruments are headed in the short and in the long term. So I think this is, people are starting to realize that it is very, very important. I have a YouTube channel that focuses a lot on fundamentals and I'm seeing so much interest in it because we have so many big stories. And when people start to learn the importance of market correlations, how um, you can use bonds to trade Forex, how you can use um, stocks um, to trade Forex, how you can use um, your dollar to um, trade gold, they start to see the market in a different way. And in the very beginning, of this conversation, Etienne, I talked about how what makes my strategy so successful is that I'm a trend trader. And um, the trends is determined by fundamentals. And, you know, I have a certain fundamental view that is determined by what's going on in the markets that will oftentimes not change. I mean, fundamentals do not change day to day. Fundamental, you know, either economy is doing well or it's doing poorly, a war does not end in a day. Um, so these are stories and things that you learn about and you understand that will um, impact the market for days, weeks, months at a time. And when you have that in the back of your minds, um, that, then you, know, you kind of lean into it, meaning that I will only take the trades in the direction of fundamentals. And that's why you know, we, we hit, I think, 9 out of 12 winning months. And you know, my accuracy uh, with my trading is so high because... 
I um, focus only on trading the setups where fundamentals are on my side. So I think people are waking up to that. They want to learn more. They want to be able to understand the big stories. And it's what really makes trading interesting too, which is that you're seeing these stories in the news and you want to learn how it, you know that affects your trades. You know that affects the stock market. You know that affects dollar. You know that affects oil. You know that affects gold. But how do you turn that into a trading opportunity? Um, I talk to a lot of technical traders, and they'll even say to me, um, they'll even say you know, off the cuff, um, yes, my trade was affected by the U.S. CPI report or the non-farm payrolls report. All of that is fundamentals. They may not be acknowledging it right off the bat, but you know they are um looking at minimally the calendar and um, incorporating that into their trade. Um, and even when these technicians don't acknowledge it, fundamentals is always a part of your trading and you will only become a better trader um, when you understand um, even the simplest aspects of fundamentals. Do you feel like fundamentals can be subjective or are they objective? Like could people make up two different stories and the same thing based on different things they look at? So are technicals, right? I mean, in many ways, you know, if you put too many indicators in your charts, you can tell, convince yourself of anything. I think technicals are oftentimes subjective as well. Um, yes, I mean, of course, fundamentals are subjective because they are, you know, when you read about something, it's about the person's opinion. But if you have um, the right people, the smart people to follow on social media who know how to interpret fundamentals correctly, it becomes less subjective because, you know, most of the people listening to this podcast won't be able to understand the right takeaways and um, fully analyze the fundamentals in the way that it should be. But it's not hard to do so if you read Bloomberg.com or um, if you look at um, uh, Reuters.com or Wall Street Journal, you know, they will explain the main takeaway to you for today's non-farm payrolls report, for example. So, um, you know, go to the experts, go to the media, you, you know, you can follow me on Twitter, Kathy Lean FX, but I'll be honest, I am, I do not do data instant insights as regularly um, as some other people because, you know, it's not my job. I'm trading oftentimes. Um, so Forex Live is really good. Um, also, um, V Patel FX, I like a lot. He does really good analysis. ING Economics does a really good job. Um, so, and of course, you know, Bloomberg and Reuters, they do some instant insights. So there are ones who more religiously um, report on data and, um, and give you instant reactions that you can follow. You can also just look at who I follow on Twitter and kind of curate, you know, that because that will allow you to see, you know, who I like instant analysis from. Also, New Squawk is really good, Financial Juice, you know, the people whose job is to analyze data. How do you know the scope of a specific team in the market where it's going to last like multiple days or is it going to be like intraday or is it going to be like many months? Can you judge how... How big is going to be the impact of that that team on the market? If it is a, I mean, it's kind of a rule of thumb where, you know, if it's only a piece of economic data like CPI or non farm payrolls, it's not going to have a lasting impact on the market. It may, it certainly will impact the market that day and most likely the day after and possibly for the rest of the week, but the market moves on. Um, what really matters is what um, central banks say and do. Um, and so that's why it's so important to follow not only um, the central bank rate decisions uh, and the speeches that happen at the central bank rate decisions, but also the speeches and the comments they make between these policy meetings. And then when it comes to economic data, there's only three that matter, which is um, the inflation report, the jobs report, as well as, and it's not consumer spending, it's um, the PMIs and ISM reports. Um, those are the only things that really matter that really can give you a sense of the direction of where economy is going on a month to month basis. Um, so it's really and then, of course, you know, you got the big um, political geopolitical themes that are, you know, COVID, you know, is going to last for a while. The um, wars are going to impact the markets for a while. The election, like once you have 
Um, and once you get to the, to the big U.S. election in 2024, um, the candidate as well as the victor is going to um, impact the markets for a while. So there are big, and then and then if there's some sort of evolution in the Chinese China U.S. relationship, the China um, Taiwan situation, those will be big stories. So the ones that sit on the front page headlines of not just the business news, but the um, the regular news are the ones that will have longer term impact on the markets. So keeping in mind that this is recording this in December, it's going to be published somewhere in January 2024. What are some of the big themes you see and how could they affect the, the markets? And I'm kind of curious to hear like specific currency pairs also, how, how they could be affected by these, uh, these themes we see right now. Well, there's going to be a couple of themes, which is number one, inflation is going to be easing across the globe. Number two, we're going to start to see interest rate cuts happen as well. We've been in a very long cycle of interest rate hikes and none of the major central banks have cut interest rates, but that's going to happen in 2024. We're going to see, and with interest rate cuts actually comes um, opportunity in a lot of the other markets. Like it could be a really good opportunity for crypto because, um, you know, when you have yield and um, increasing in your savings accounts, crypto becomes less interesting. When you have, um, so you could have, and usually crypto does well when we are, are have a um, bull market or a risk on mood. And typically when interest rates cuts happen, that could support the equity market, which could support, make um, crypto a bit more attractive. You also have um, elections. And there's going to be a lot of focus on, you know, election um, uh, candidates and uncertainty. And that's going to also be a really big um, uh, focus of the new year. So, you know, I think we're going to be looking at th those three primary themes. And um, in terms of opportunity, I think, you know, you're going to see carry trades um, yields start to shrink because of these interest rate cuts. So um, some of the juicier carry trade bets um, are going to be less attractive. Um, and so, you know, you can see uh, money come out of that. Um, the yen could start to strengthen more um, in the 2024, especially since um, the zero interest rate policy is finally, you know, most likely going to be unwound um, next year. And Japan, you know, Warren Buffett has really been focusing on Japan um, as the new opportunity. So I think yen itself um, is one of my favorite currencies for, for the new year. Now, would that mean you would trade more in today or would that mean you would kind of look more for swing trades with these teams? Or I'm not going to change what I do. Um, I don't think that on a year-to-year -year basis, the themes really um, affect my trading strategy. It should not, right? Um, I think my strategy is still going to be focus on the trend on a swing and um, day trading basis. And, and the trends and the, the stories will determine the trends. The story of whether the BOJ truly comes out of ZERP, of who is the first central bank to lower interest rates. Those things um, will determine what, um, what I trade. Because I always say fundamentals determine what you trade um, and technicals determine when you trade. So, you know, I'm going to be watching the themes and I'm going to use my technicals to time my entries. A lot of people are going to probably want to ask, how can they learn like, those fundamentals? Where can they go to learn this stuff? Like they might want to follow people on social media, but they also want to eventually know themselves what to focus on. Well, um, you can follow me. I talk about fundamentals a lot on uh, YouTube. I have a lot of videos on that. It's um, Our channel is YouTube uh, forward slash BK Forex. And also, I have a fundamentals course, which you can find the link on um, in, in a YouTube channel or on bktraders.com. You can, um, we've got a fundamentals course there, and I invite you to um, take the uh, starter course, which can give you a nice little, um, you know, uh, leg up in understanding how fundamentals um, really impact the markets. Sounds good. Uh, you're one of the most committed traders out there. I know who's actually teaching good stuff to traders, and that, that's a good thing, of course. Uh, I know people who learned a lot from you and myself included in the past, so definitely good to have you put this stuff out there and help people. Thank you so much. And, you know, with the Fundamentals Trading Course, it's called the Fundamentals Fast, fast Track Trading Course. And um, that's really, you know, what I try to do, which is try to help people understand 
how to use fundamentals to trade, but without wasting a lot of your time to learn about the academic portion of fundamental analysis. So where can people connect with you and find out more about your work at the end? You mentioned YouTube, Twitter, and your course, but anywhere else can, they, they can reach out to you and uh, connect with you? I mean, that's the best way. Um, I just want to tell everyone that there's a lot of people using my name to scam um, other people. I've tried very hard to um, prevent that. You know, First of all, if on Instagram and Twitter, I have the check mark. If anyone is contacting you without the check mark using my face, my name, they're um, a scam or fraud. Also, I will never, ever, ever direct message you. I love you all, but I will never direct message you at all. Anyone using my name to direct message you is a scam. I will never ask you to send me money to deposit into some sort of a um, brokerage account. They are also a scam. So be smart. You can always direct message me on Twitter and ask me, did you ask me to do this? And chances are my answer will be no. Um, but you know, also be smart and understand that I will never direct message you. I will never ask you to deposit money with me. And if anyone does, you know, do not do that. People have a lot of other stuff. It's a big, big problem out there for sure. Thank you, Kathy, for your time. Appreciate the advice you give here to my listeners. Hopefully you can bring you back on in the future and uh, discuss more fundamentals and, and new trading perspective.